One of the most powerful features of Workbench, and perhaps the most powerful feature of Workbench, is the workflow mechanism. So let's take a look at the workflows. If I do view workflow, we can see that the workflow window appears here and we have um, an area at the top called models and then we have instances. Models are blueprints, if you like, the plan of how you actually achieve the task. And then what you do is you create instances of that for each project or each instance uh, in the Object Explorer that you're going to investigate. I'm going to investigate a particular problem and we can look at that problem. We have a video of it. Uh, now the problem happens about two minutes in. Let's come up to somewhere around here. Now what happens is the user clicks on the instructor's link you see just here and if you look at the top of the browser window you can see we have a little spinning um, circle and that happened at about 1 minute 50 into the video and over here you can see we have a marker set up all ready to go it's marker number seven and you can see that as the instructor's panel returned um, the user hit the send marker button to actually send marker number seven and here we see the details m equals seven and we can see that it happened at around 15 40 31. So that's all useful stuff. Uh, so that's the problem we're going to investigate. So we're going to use this particular workflow here. So let's start a new instance of that workflow. Now the workflow, uh, the workflows are modeled on the work of um, various people. This particular one is modeled on the work of Laura Chapel. Um, she's done a great series of videos and what's really good about Laura's work is she works in a, a very systematic and methodical way so it's quite easy for us to uh, model her workflow. We've actually added some, some further um, steps to our workflow because Laura starts from the point where the trace data is already quite well ordered and, and maybe pre-filtered. And so we've added steps to deal with uh, the um, identification of the area of the trace that causes the problem. And then we've also added the capability of dealing with uh, markers if you use them, which Laura didn't use in this case, and also dealing with things like transarm and other um, features. But all of these things are optional and we'll see as we go through the workflow that the workflow adapts to the circumstances that you're in and what tools you have and what markers you have, etc. So we have some introductory text here. We then have a bit more introductory text saying, uh, giving some advice on capturing data. And then we're into the workflow proper. Now the user that experienced the problem was Mark. First thing you notice is this next step now has some context. So you can see it's already referring to Mark as being the person who accessed the application. The application was called Contoso. The response time was around 30 seconds. That was what Mark reported. How did he access Contoso? Well, he used a PC. What was his IP address? 192.168. 10.81 the file set where the uh, traces were captured is this file set here client PC so drag client PC file set onto the work pad so that's the first action did he send a marker yes he did the marker was marker number seven. Now drag and drop the marker finder tool onto the work pad. And that whizzes through the trace file and finds the markers. So we've done that. What's the frame number for marker number seven? Well, this is the frame, so it's 173. Record the time here of the frame, 15. 40, 31, which is good because if you remember that matched what we saw in the video. So that's 
reassuring. Uh, now we have to calculate the problem time frame. Now this is something we currently have to do manually. In the future, um, the workflow will do this for us. But right now we have to do this manually. So it says subtract 30 seconds and a further minute from uh, the time of the marker. So 30 seconds would make it 15.40.01. So it will be 15.39.01. Calculate the end by adding one minute to the marker time. So 15, 40, 32. And of course I've just added a second rather than a minute, but that's no problem, we can undo that. Uh, in fact, I'd typed in completely the wrong thing, so let's do that again. And so the time is 15, 41, 31. So that's the end time frame. Close the marker finder tool. Okay, close that. That's done. Now drag the filter tool onto the work pad. That's done. Click on the details tab. Enter 192.168.10.81. Into the filter box. Enter 80 into there. That's done. Now drag the left time slider to 15.3901 uh, and drag the right slider to 15.4131. Now if you get have trouble getting these precisely in the right position, um, you can widen the time range slightly. Um, I wouldn't advise you to narrow it, but just do it as close as you can. But if you're erring one way or the other, err on the side of safety to make the time range slightly wider than needed. Okay. Click the filter button in the lower pane, and which we've done. Uh, the filter tool will generate one file or more. In, in our case, it's one because we've got one input file. Uh, take a note of the where the output file is. Okay. And then close the filter tool. So close the filter tool. That's done. Go into the object explorer. Go to the network traces icon. Add a file set and call it user traces. Okay, we've done that. Right click on the user traces and choose add file and navigate to where the output filtered data was placed. And that will be in here, just there. Okay, uh, notice how this and this have the same name, but this doesn't give a problem because they're in two different um, containers. So that's fine. Select all files in the folder. Oh, I've just done that. So I, there was just one and I selected that and I've added that to the file trace set. So that's done. We're now ready to examine the trace file. Okay, so let's clear this. And it says drag the first trace file, well there is only one actually, um, onto the work pad. Drag the marker finder tool, this is just to make sure we've still got the markers. And sure enough we've still got marker number seven, so that looks good. Yep, identify marker number seven, we've done that. I'm going through this quite quickly because obviously you can stop the video and look at any, you know, look at the detail at any point. Uh, right on, click on the marker and choose show in frame. So right click, show frame in Wireshark rather. Okay, done that. Uh, frame number for the marker, 138. The reason it's asking as it explains here is that uh, because we filtered the frame, uh, filtered the, because we filtered the file, the frame number that we had for the marker before was is not the same frame frame number now so we need to look again in the packet detail pane go to tcp header 
protocol preferences and uncheck allow sub dissector to reassemble TCP streams. So let's do that. TCP header, right click, protocol preferences, and I already have that unchecked. Now this is uh, part of um, Laura's workflow. She prefers to work with without the reassembly enabled. So um, we're following her workflow. Am I using Transsample? No, I'm not. Uh, in the packet detail frame, expand the hypertext protocol. Click on that. Scroll down to response in frame. Okay, so let's go to there. Scroll down to response in frame and double click on that. Okay, that's done. In the HTTP header, find the detailed time since request, right click and apply as a column. So that's that value there. Right click, apply as a column. That's applied way over there. So let's pull that into here. So it's a bit more visible. Done that. Right click on the column header and edit it and change it to HTTP time. Right click, edit and change the title to HTTP time. Okay, that's good. That's complete. Go back to marker number seven by using control G and then entering 138. So this is how you quickly jump around in a Wireshark trace. And that has indeed taken us back to the marker. Start at the marker and scroll backwards looking for an HTTP time value that is similar to 30 seconds. Well, actually I don't have to go very far because it's right there. Um, so let's see what we have to do next. Did you find one? Yes, I did. What's the frame number? The frame number of that one is 132. Uh, go to the matching request packet. Request in frame. Okay, so request in frame. So this is the request packet. Interesting that it should say have instructor in the URL when we know that the user clicked on an instructor link. So that all looks very promising. Uh, that's in 114, 114. So we'll take that. Right click on 114 and choose conversation filter and then TCP. Uh, conversation filter, TCP. Okay, that's done. Uh, what's the request at 114 retransmitted? Look at the TCP retransmission column. So if we go to 114 and then just scroll down, in fact, we've only got the request. The request is acknowledged by the server and it's acknowledged very quickly. And then we get the response uh, 29 seconds later. Um, there are no retransmissions in that area, so we can answer no to that. And the workflow concludes that we've got an application problem um, and then suggests some further steps uh, to look at that problem. And that then brings us to the end of the flow. So three different things to take out of this. The first one is that uh, the workflow takes our input and starts to contextualize further steps of the workflow, which makes it easier to understand and um, less likely for us to mis misinterpret the instruction. The second thing is that the workflow is adaptive if we had have answered in this point here where we said, uh, where it asks, was the request in 114 retransmitted? If we had have answered yes there, in fact, we can delete back to that point and try it. Um, what it then would do is it takes us on a different path. We need to check the total time span for retransmission. So you can see that it's, it's forking at that point um, when it 
when we give certain answers to the questions. And so there's the contextual aspect of workflow. There's the forking, the adaptive um, aspect of workflow. And the third thing is the thing that I just showed you is you can delete back to any point in the workflow if you think you've made a mistake and resume at that point. Okay, I think that covers the basics of workflow.